Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you. Uh, welcome here to our Bible study tonight at, uh, at First Assembly. Uh, a little bit late getting on. Sorry about that. I'm about three minutes late, according to my watch. But uh, here we are. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and a um, little bit muggy here, Cape May. Those of you who are uh, outside the area, I guess if you're in any area here in New Jersey, you're definitely uh, going to experience the mugginess this time of year. End of summer. Or late in the summer, and uh, just a beautiful day, but very, very, very muggy. Well, I hope you're doing well, and uh, we are um, in our Bible study, and tonight we are in Genesis chapter 8, and um, it is the uh, back end story of the flood, the uh, end of the flood story, if you will. Um, I'm going to uh, just show you what I'm reading from here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it real well on, uh, on my screen, but I'll share it with you anyway. Um, that's the wrong screen. Um, there you go. And uh, let me see if I can make this bigger uh, so at least you could see it. There you go. That might help a little bit. Um, and uh, so I'm going to read from uh, chapter uh, 8 of Genesis. It says, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and the livestock that were in the ark, and God made the wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. And the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were closed, and the rains uh, from heaven was heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of the 150 days, the waters had abated, and in the seventh month, on the seventh day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of forty days, Noah opened the, the window of the ark and made, that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him and to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark. The waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark. He waited another seven days, and then again he set forth the dove out of the ark. And the gov came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth, and he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him any more. In the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried off of the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month of the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. God said to Noah, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your wives with you and, and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps along the ground and that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife's sons with him. Every beast and every creeping thing and every bird and everything that moves along the earth went out by families from the ark. Then God, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of the clean animals and some of the, uh, I'm sorry, took some of the some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, he said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I strike down every living creature as I have done, while the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. Um, so there's some, uh, there's some great, I messed that up. Sorry. Um, some great themes here, um, in, uh, in this story. And, um, and I just want to uh, share them with you. Um, I want to talk tonight about, um, I want to talk about baptism. I want to talk about, um, 
uh, remembering. I want to talk about birds and uh, I want to talk about bows. Uh, so water, birds, and bows. Uh, let, let's uh, let's see if we can get through this tonight. Um, and, uh, um, and, and as always, if you have any questions, you can put them in the comments and uh, we can, um, re we can uh, in real time, uh, try to answer the questions. And uh, actually, you can even come on if you're interested and we could actually talk. Uh, we're set up to do that. Uh, and uh, if you want to, I can send you the link or put the link in the comments. Um, but I would just want to, um, first, I want to talk about this phrase, God remembered Noah. There's so much packed in here. There's no way we're going to get through every single word. But I want to, I want to start with this word, God remembered Noah. Um, and this is a common word you're going to find in the Old Testament, uh, where God remembers. Now, in our... Um, Western way of thinking, um, we really um, miss this. We really miss what this means because we think like this. We think um, God, um, when we hear remember, let's say, okay, I remembered to pick up my kid from school. So what we're kind of saying there is, uh, oh, I forgot, but then I remembered. And then I, you know, maybe did something. Um, this isn't saying that God forgot about Noah. This isn't saying like the the floods like going on and everything. And then God says, oh, that's right. Noah. Noah's in a boat. I remember him now. That's not what this is talking about uh, when we say remember. Uh, the way the Hebrew uses remember is a little bit more like this. Let's say that um, I wake up in the morning. It's my anniversary. And uh, my, uh, I don't say anything to my wife. I don't buy her any flowers. I don't buy her anything. I don't take her out to dinner. I don't do anything. We just go through our day. We go through a normal day. And, um, and um, my phone's ringing. Um, we don't do anything. We just, um, you know, go through our day. And at the end of the day, we're climbing into bed and she looks really upset. And I say to her, oh, you, you look upset. What are you upset about? And she says to me, um, well, it's our anniversary and you forgot about it. And imagine if I said to her, oh, no, I didn't forget at all. <laughs> well, would that make things better? Right. If I said I remembered something, uh, this word remember uh, is is really talking about a focus upon an object with an action. Uh, that's and, and so in that case, that's the only case, one of the few cases we use remembering in the way the Hebrews would use it would be anniversaries, birthdays, things like that. In other words, we're taking an action um, when we remember. And that's what what's happening here. God is taking a saving action towards Noah. God remembers Noah. And so he takes action towards him. Uh, this is really great news for us because God remembers us. Uh, God cannot forget us. And uh, I can um, say to you one of the greatest prayers, one of my most favorite prayers, um, just as a Christian, um, is this simple prayer, um, God, re, um, God remember me, right? This simple question, this simple prayer, God remember me. And, um, and uh, it's powerful. Uh, because um, in that prayer, you're simply saying, God, you know all the promises you've made towards me. Now remember me. And, um, and when God remembers us, that means he acts towards us. I pray that prayer a lot. Sometimes I just don't know what to pray. Sometimes I'm going through stuff that is just too hard for me, too difficult for me to comprehend. Sometimes I just don't know how to pray. Uh, I'll pray in the spirit a lot. I'll pray in my prayer language. Uh, we believe, I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe God has blessed us with that, and it's a prayer language. So sometimes I'll pray that. Sometimes I don't know. But sometimes all I can do is just simply say this prayer, Remember me, Lord. Remember me. And uh, it's powerful. God remembered Noah uh, because Noah... Uh, even though he was in the ark, he still needed a saving act from God to uh, to get out of the ark. Uh, think about what's going on with Noah right now. This is, um, you know, uh, 150 days on the ark, um, just waiting and waiting. There's no word from God. Uh, excuse me. 
there's um there's no word from God for all that time. Noah's not hearing from God. Noah's not knowing. Noah doesn't know what's going to come next. And so uh, during this time, uh, he is um, he's just waiting, and he doesn't realize it, but God remembers him, and God is going to perform a saving act to change his life, to bring him into a place. See, it wasn't just saving from the waters uh, that God was interested in. Uh, God was interested in uh, giving him new life, new creation. So there's a real picture here of new creation, newness. There's there's a, this idea that God brings us through the ark, th brings us through the time of darkness into the time of 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 saving into the time of new creation and so we experience that now we experience the new creation that god makes us we experience the joy of uh being created new cre newly created in god uh, but also we experience this ultimately in the new heavens and the new earth at the end of time uh, where all things will be made new uh, and i love that we went through revelation last year What's great about uh, that that whole idea is God doesn't say, "Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna wipe this out and I'm gonna create it uh, again." He's saying, "I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna make it all new." Um, and so this is this is a powerful promise that God doesn't just make things better; He makes things new. Um, uh, so um, the scriptures say another another thing that just stands out to me. Uh, God calls a wind to pass over the earth. This is a great statement. God calls the wind to pass over the earth. So it says God remembers Noah and he caused the wind to pass over the earth. We see the same terminology when the Israelites were about to go through the Red Sea. It says an east wind blew and then the waters uh, parted. Um, and, and, and so wind is also used on the day of Pentecost. It says has a sound as if a, a mighty rushing wind. Also, when you talk about wind in the Bible, the Hebrew word uh, is, is the word that is used for the spirit, right? So the spirit is the wind of God, the breath of God. Uh, and so there, there's this picture of the spirit moving. Uh, so, so this isn't just, hey, it's getting windy outside. This is a picture of the spirit moving, God sending forth his salvation through the work of the Holy Spirit. See, this is how God works. The Father, uh, the, the Father uh, has the plan of salvation. He sent his son uh, Christ to to uh, bring salvation to all of us who uh, died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead, uh, ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God. And now the spirit moves to bring salvation into his people and throughout the world. And so uh, we uh, have uh, the spirit of God, uh, the scripture says, as a, a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Uh, and so I really hold on to that a lot in my life, the, the sense of God's spirit in my life, knowing that this is a deposit of what is to come, that this is a, a sign of God's promise to me. Um, and uh, I, I love that there's this creation, there's this connection between creation and deliverance. I think of Jesus when he's uh, healing the blind man. And then he kneels down and he gets mud and he puts it in the man's eyes. And then he says, what do you see now? And the guy has to wash up in the water. I love that miracle because it's it's how God works. God uses creation. God uses real things to bring forth his miracles. I, I think uh, often uh, he will use the people of God to uh, to supply for other people. And you would say, wow, this is a miracle. Uh, is it is it really a miracle that someone uh, gave you money that you didn't ask for? Is it really a miracle that someone visited you and you weren't expecting them? Well, yeah, it is, because that's how God works. God works within his creation. And uh, and and so God uses creation to bring forth his work, his miracles. Um, and so um, I love that aspect of it. Um, and um, and I just think about uh, the Psalms that describe times like this, where there, there, there's certain Psalms that describe these times of darkness. I used to like to I used to not like to read these Psalms. I would say, ah, you know, 
this is depressing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but as I've gone through times of darkness in my life, these mean a lot to me. Uh, some of these psalms, and you'll 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 see that one of the themes will be, you know, I'm going, God, where are you? Um, why did you forsake me? Why 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 aren't you coming through? Why aren't you um, helping us? And there's this crying out to God, and then at the end of the psalm, there's often this. Uh, proclamation of salvation. I know that you will save me. And and this is just such a picture of uh, what the Christian life is often like. We, we are saved. We're put into the ark. But then sometimes we go through this time of darkness. We go through this time of confusion. We're waiting on God. And um, we, sometimes we're not getting the word from God about what is next, what's going to happen. And we got to wait on that word. But God ultimately remembers us. God brings the, the word. God brings the promise to us. Um, we have the word and the promise of darkness. And by the way, I've said this before. Um, what you do when you're not hearing from God is you keep doing the last thing God told you to do. And so if you're in a place right now where you say, I just, I just, God's not speaking to me. I don't know what to do. Well, um, you just go back to doing the last thing God told you. Um, uh, you know, sometimes psalmists ask if God is angry, uh, the, and then they bring up the history of God. Like, and so one of the histories that could even be brought up is how God delivered Noah. And, uh, and Peter brings this out. If you read, uh, uh, I believe it's 2 Peter, where he talks a lot about the flood and how God saved uh, people through the flood, through the waters. By the way, a lot of ideas of baptism here. Very interesting. Um, and, um, you know, I, I just think of the book of Lamentations, where Jeremiah is just complaining. Uh, and you go, why, why is that in there? Because God wants us to know that we can complain to him. That, that he's tough enough for it, that he's uh, big enough for it, that we can say, God, when are you going to speak to me? When are you going to come through for me? When are you going to to deliver me? Uh, we can ask him the tough questions. We can ask him what's going on. We can struggle with God. And that's a good thing. Uh, and God lets us do that. And then he speaks to us. Remember, we have a God that um, didn't just, you know, uh, a lot of, I, I've said this a lot, especially as we were going through the book of Revelation. I said, um, God is in control. Jesus is on the throne. And that's comforting sometimes. <laughs> but what's better, I guess, is um, saying that we have a God that was willing to go through all the things we went through. He understands. He came to be with us, to live with us. To He is the ark. He is the one that, that uh, saved us through the waters. Christ came to be with us. God descended to be a man and live among us. There's no other religion in the world that says that. Christianity is the only one that says you don't have to climb a mountain to find God. You don't have to uh, go and do some great thing to get God's attention. He's coming to you. He wants to be with you. And so if you're going through a difficult time right now, remember, is Jesus on the cross that said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knows what it's like to feel forsaken. And, and yet he is without sin. Um, I, I think of this in this idea of remembering too, uh, just this thought. Um, Joseph is in prison, right? And he says, um, he, he gives these, uh, the cup baker, the cup, the guy that holds the cup for Pharaoh uh, and the baker, uh, they're, they're there and he gives them these dreams and he tells the guy that the, the cup bearer to Pharaoh, uh, hey, you're going to be set free in three days. And, and he says to him, um, will you remember me when you leave? And, um, and the scripture says that he didn't remember Joseph, you know, uh, and, um, and I just think God remembers men forget. And uh, so uh, I, I thank God that we don't have a God that's like a man. God remembers us. Um, but there are some things that God forgets. And that is God forgets. Uh, he forgets our sins. And, uh, and this is so important because he doesn't act towards us. He acts towards us as if we are not sinners at all. 
it's really amazing. I mean, we can't get that. I can't wrap that my head around that half the time. But God treats me as if I, I've never been a sinner. And I am completely righteous because he gives me the righteousness of Christ. Um, and so he remembers us as his children. But, the, uh, you know, in in First Corinthians 13, you know, the love chapter there. Um, I love when I'm doing a wedding and someone reads the love chapter of First Corinthians uh, 13. And it's beautiful. But, you know, it wasn't meant for weddings. And I almost want to say um, at the wedding. I, I want to say, hey, hey, guys, if you are expecting your spouse to act this way, uh, you're going to be waiting a long time <laughs> because what's described there uh, is really Christ. This is how Christ is towards us. Now, obviously, that's what we aspire to. That's what we want God to do in our life. God, we want God to work that love in our life. One of the things that it says there is just so powerful is love keeps no record of wrongs. And boy, that is our Heavenly Father. He keeps no record of wrongs. Aren't you glad that uh, through Jesus Christ, there are no records of wrongs kept of you? Um, your cell phone remembers your wrongs more than God does. Twitter remembers your wrongs more than God does. God doesn't remember. He chooses to forget, and he does. Um, so let's talk about birds. Uh, Noah's in the ark and he sends out two birds. First, he sends out a raven. The raven goes out and comes back with nothing. Now, um, ravens are unclean birds. There, there, there are clean birds and unclean birds. There are clean animals and unclean animals. Uh, it doesn't mean that the unclean animals are, are like evil or something. Uh, and, and the raven has come to mean death in later years with the poems of Edgar Allan Poe uh, uh, and, and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, here, you know, the raven is an unclean bird that's being sent out. And, uh, and then Moses sends, the raven comes back with nothing. Moses sent out a dove, and at first the dove doesn't come back with anything. But then uh, the dove comes back with an olive branch. So, um Martin Luther has a take on this that's really interesting. And I know uh, we don't want to get too into being allegorical with the scripture. We want to just let it say what it says. Uh, but to Luther, um, he says that uh, the, the raven is the emblem of the law. It goes out, it accuses, and finds nothing but wrong. And when it returns, it has nothing left. So the raven comes from God. The raven's made from God. So the law goes out from God. And it accuses us, but it accuses us so that we can um, we can realize that we need God, right? So all the law can do is accuse. Uh, but uh, to uh, Luther, the dove represents uh, the gospel, which comes back and brings an olive branch, brings a, a message of peace, a message of hope. So here's Noah in the ark. He is in this dark place. He's waiting. And then he finally gets a message. But where's the message come? Message comes from the dove. The message says that the water is seceding, that there's going to be a time when you're going to get out of this ark. Uh, because this this dove comes back with an olive branch. And we know the olive branch is also, in, in our idioms, is representative of peace, right? The dove comes back and brings peace. It brings a message uh, of peace. Um, so the dove comes back without a message of condemnation, or the raven comes back with a message of condemnation. There's no hope when a raven comes back, but there's hope when a dove comes back. Well, that's an interesting take. That's Luther's take. We do know this, that at Jesus's baptism, how did the Spirit show up? The Spirit showed up as a dove. Um, the baptism of Jesus Christ is really one of the most important aspects of Scripture. It's the beginning of Christ's ministry. Um, and so Christ uh, goes into this water where everybody is... Um, is going in sinful, right? So all the sinners are going into this water. Christ says to, John the Baptist says to him, I, I should be baptized by you. You shouldn't be here. And uh, Jesus says, I must do this to fulfill all righteousness. Now, oftentimes the way you hear that preached is um, someone will say, uh, well, Jesus was being obedient, 
right? And showing us that he, we need to be obedient and get baptized. Well, I'm not saying that's completely wrong, but I think it's much deeper than that. Um, it really is this. All those people. This is the beginning of Christ's ministry and what Christ's ministry was to was ultimately what his ministry was, was to take on our sin and give us his righteousness. So all the people are going into the water and they're getting uh, they're, they're they're going in dirty and they're coming out clean. Jesus is clean and he goes into the water filled with sinners. He goes down into the same water and he comes up dirty. Not because he sinned, but because he takes on all the sins of mankind. And so it's interesting. You got two stories of water, Old and New Testament, and you have the story of the ark and a dove. And the ark going, passing through the water, coming to dry land. Now, when Jesus is baptized, um, the Father speaks, the Spirit descends like a dove, right? A dove comes down and descends onto Jesus. And God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Um, so you got the Trinity right there, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, when, when the Father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, right? Hey, Victoria, you're watching. Thank you. Hey, Terry, good to see you. Thanks for uh, your comments there. When, when the Father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, this is the first time in human history that God looks at a man and says, on his own merit, I am pleased with him because he has kept the law. He has kept everything. And yet it is there that Jesus begins to take on the ministry of taking on our sin. And so um, it, I, I think it's, it's very interesting that the dove is here uh, coming to the ark, bringing the message of peace, and then the Holy Spirit descends on Christ uh, at his baptism and also brings the message of peace, uh, brings the message that uh, salvation is coming. So I think Luther might have something here with these birds. It's kind of an interesting picture. Um, uh, now we can say this because of what Christ has done, right? I mean, this is really Christ's whole baptism, this this compacted message of the gospel, right? And because of what Christ has done, um, we are now God looks at us and just think about this because you probably never thought about this uh, regarding yourself. But God looks at me, God looks at you and says, this is my child in whom I'm well pleased. And you say, well, no, there's no way God's saying that about me. Oh, absolutely. He is. He's pleased because Christ has taken on all your sin. Uh, Christ not only has taken on all your sin, he has given you his righteousness. That's what we're doing when we get baptized. We're going down and into the water. We're leaving our old life. We're coming up new. And now when we come up, that doesn't mean we don't sin anymore. But as we are struggling with this life of sin, we, we come to God in repentance and God uh, forgives us. God changes us. His spirit is working in our lives. God has come to us with a message of peace. And this is good news for us because he sets us free. Um, and he is, uh, he is the one that is coming to us with this message. He is the one. He is the ark for us. What did John say at the baptism? He said, uh, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And, um, you know, when we think of lambs, we'd say, oh, something that's gentle and kind. Uh, but that's not what John was saying. John was talking about all the Old Testament sacrifices and all the lambs that would come and sacrifice for our sins. And he said, this is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And so all those sacrifices were in Christ. The, the ark was in Christ, and, and, and the law was in Christ, and all the sacrifices are in Christ. And, and, and he is the one that takes away our sins. He is the Lamb of God, the ultimate sacrifice for us. Um, and, and, and just think about it, that um, he is the one that passed through every stage of life for you and for me. I just keep thinking about that. Like he had to go through um, being born. He had to go through being hungry. He had to go through just life. He had to, you know, God came and, um, and you know, as a young man, the, the Bible says his first miracle 
was at a wedding when after his ministry started in the book of John, right? So Jesus didn't walk around as a kid doing miracles everywhere. Um, he um, he came and like was building cabinets and working as a carpenter and living life and uh, and just this is God coming and living our lives. Uh, this is just uh, so powerful. Um, and so Christ kept the law for us and was a sacrifice for us. But let me get back to uh, this story and I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, and I'm going to wrap it up with the rainbow. Um, and the rainbow means different things today that it, that it really means. Uh, someone said to me, uh, we were walking by, um, uh, this painting of this rainbow. And of course it represented, um, uh, LGBT, LG, I can't do all the things, LG, Q stuff, right? And of course, that's what the rainbow meant that they painted. And they said that, you know, I want to get a picture in front of this rainbow. And I, I wanted to say to him, oh, you really like the promise of God that he's not going to flood the earth again. So great. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this isn't just a promise that God isn't going to flood the earth again. Um, in the Hebrew, he says the, the word here is this. He says, see, I put my bow in the clouds, right? In the Hebrew, um, there's no word for rainbow. It's just bow, as in a bow and arrow. Uh, and God is saying, look, I put my bow in the clouds, right? And then he gets this promise that he's never going to flood the earth again. So when you look at a rainbow, you're looking at a bow that's like this. And uh, what, what God is doing here is he's saying, look, I've hung up my bow. And when a warrior would hang up their bow, usually they would hang it up so it sits like this. I don't know if this is a good picture I'm doing with my finger. God is saying, I hung up my bow. I hung up my weapon of war. Uh, no longer am I going to be at war with mankind because I'm going to send a savior. That, so it's so much more. Next time you look at a rainbow, don't just say, well, this is a sign that God promised not to flood the earth again. No, this is another promise of Christ. God saying, I'm hanging up my bow and no longer am I going to be in um, in war at war with mankind, but I'm going to bring peace. I'm going to bring uh, deliverance. I'm going to bring new life. So Noah, walking out of the boat, sacrificing to God, um, uh, worshiping God, and God smells the aroma and put and says, "I smell the aroma of the sacrifice," and so I'm hanging up my bow, and now I'm no longer at war. Well, if that's not a picture of Christ, I don't know what is. That is just so amazing to think about. And uh, it's all over the book of Genesis where God is just screaming at us, Christ is coming and uh, your salvation is coming. So I want to leave you with that tonight. I really appreciate you guys joining with me. I, I see Vicky is here. I, I see um, uh, Terry is here. I don't know if anyone else is here. Um, uh, she said, I just learned something new. I didn't know that about the bow. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, it was pretty, pretty new for me, too. I was doing some reading on it, and uh, that's really powerful, isn't it? It's just really powerful when you think about it. Um, so uh, thanks for, for sharing that. Um, and, uh, oh, hey, Shirley, how you doing? Thank you for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. And uh, uh, hopefully I get to meet you face-to-face -face soon. I don't know if we've met face-to-face -face yet, but thank you for joining um, so, uh, just, uh, just a few things before we wrap up on, uh, September 26 is going to be our, uh, welcome back Sunday. We got a lot of things planned. It's going to be an outside event. Uh, the whole thing's going to be outside. We're, we, we're looking to have, uh, police and fire here. We're looking to have, um, different community groups here. We're going to do an outside service. We're going to have a pig roast. Uh, an unclean animal, but that's okay. They're clean now, uh, according to scripture, so we could do that. Uh, and uh, we're just going to have a great time. So we want to invite you to come 1030, uh, September 26. And uh, please mark that in your calendars, invite a friend. And we're really looking forward to that. Uh, again, if you want to give to this ministry, go to capemayfirstassembly.org, uh, or you could uh, text to give. Uh, that's uh, 609-400-4075. God bless you guys tonight. I just want to pray with you before we go. Father, 
we, we give you thanks and praise tonight for your goodness, your mercy. Uh, we thank you for uh, your bow that you've hung up in the sky to remind us that you're not fighting with us, uh, God, but you uh, are calling us to yourself. And uh, we thank you so much uh, for your goodness and your mercy to us today. And we glorify your name. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Uh, and this is my wave to you. But God bless you. We look forward to seeing you uh, Sunday morning and uh, next week.